Hi, today we're going to dive into the fascinating world of electricity. I'll focus on how home electrical systems work, but first we need to lay down some basic principles. So let's start with a few essential facts about electricity. First, electricity will only flow if there's a complete circuit or path for it to travel. Second, if a person touches something that's electrically energized, they could complete the circuit, which may result in a shock or even electrocution. Third, electricity always tries to return to its source. Fourth, electricity doesn't just take the easiest path, it takes all available paths to complete a circuit. Fifth, building on number four, more current will flow through paths of least resistance. Imagine water flowing down a mountain or a hill. There's often a main flow, but other smaller streams or tributaries branching off. The same is true for electricity. Now let's talk about three key electrical terms you need to know. First is voltage. This is the electrical pressure pushing electrons through a wire. It's similar to how pressure pushes water through a water hose or a pipe. Next is current. This refers to the amount of electricity or electrons flowing through a conductor. It's similar to how much water is flowing through a pipe or through a hose. Third is resistance. Resistance is the opposition to electrical flow. Think of it like squeezing a water hose, closing a valve, or putting a nozzle on the end of a hose to slow down the water flow. Electricity comes in two basic forms. You have direct current, which is DC, and alternating current, which is abbreviated AC. Let's start with DC because it's the simplest. So DC, as I said, is direct current. It's often produced by sources like batteries or solar panels. In DC, the voltage remains constant over time. Here's a graph showing how DC voltage behaves. It's a straight line, always pushing in one direction only. Now let's look at a basic DC circuit. We'll start with a power source. Let's use a battery. Now let's add a load, and in our case, we'll use a light bulb. Now let's add a conductor to take the electricity from the battery to the light bulb. But wait, this light bulb won't light up yet. That's because electricity needs a complete circuit. It must have a way to return to its source, the battery. So let's add another wire to complete the circuit. And let's throw in a switch to control the flow of this electricity. Let me explain one thing. In this diagram, you see two yellow dots. These represent electricity. When the dots in my animations are not moving, it means the circuit is energized, but electricity is not flowing. Now let's close the switch. See how electricity flows from the battery through the switch to the light and back to the battery? When we open the switch, the flow stops because the circuit is broken or open. Now let's do something interesting. Let's flip the battery around. The gold part of the battery is the positive terminal. So once we flip it, you'll see that the electricity is now flowing in the opposite direction. Now let's switch over to AC, or alternating current. We'll replace the battery with an AC power source. In our case, this is going to be a transformer. Now transformers don't generate the electricity, but they convert the electricity to a voltage that our homes can use. So the spring or the coil in the diagram represents the output part of a transformer. In AC systems, the current and voltage are constantly changing directions. In North America, we use 60 hertz electricity, meaning that it changes directions back and forth 60 times every second. That's fast, but this graph gives you a basic idea of how AC alternates between positive and negative voltage. Now let's take a look at what happens in an AC circuit with a light bulb. When we close the switch, you'll notice the electricity pulsing back and forth, changing directions 60 times per second. This is alternating current in action. Here's a cool animation of a transformer in action. It steps down electricity from thousands of volts to 240 volts just before it enters our homes. The magnetic force inside the transformer induces a lower voltage in the secondary winding, which is the output. This lower voltage makes it safe for the appliances and other loads in our homes to use. If you want more details on transformers, I have, or will have soon, a complete in-depth video on the topic. But in the meantime, here's some pictures of some typical transformers that supply electricity to our homes. You've probably seen them in your neighborhood. Now let's zoom in on a typical 240 volt transformer. One side is at zero volts and the other side is at 240 volts. Now voltage is relative, meaning it's always measured compared to something else. If we connect something across both legs of the transformer, we get 240 volts. This is how large appliances like ovens and clothes dryers are powered. To show how we can get 120 volts and 240 volts out of a transformer, let's first look at an example that you're probably familiar with. Let's use a battery. Let's take two one and a half volt batteries and connect them end to end or in series. Together, they'll act like a three volt battery. But if we connect a wire to the middle where the two batteries meet, then we've basically created a neutral. Now, if we connect a load between 
one end and the neutral, then we only get one and a half volts. If we connect across both ends, we get three volts. So now let's apply this idea to transformers. To make this simpler to visualize, I've split a transformer in half to show it as two separate transformers. When we connect the two 120 volt transformers together with a neutral in the middle, we get our 240 volts across the combined transformer. This is how we get both 120 and 240 volts in our homes. Appliances, again, like clothes dryers and ovens, use 240 volts for some parts, and they use 120 volts for others, like lights and timers. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Let's get back to our transformer animation. We add a neutral wire to the center of the transformer, creating what's called a center tap neutral, and the other end of this neutral wire is connected to a ground rod which is driven into the ground. The bottom leg of the transformer is at negative 120 volts, and the upper of the leg is at positive 120 volts. They're out of phase with each other, which means that one leg is positive while the other leg is negative, and vice versa. Here's a graph that shows what out of phase means. You can see that while one leg of electricity is positive, the other is negative in exactly the same amount. So they're always exactly opposite of each other. Now that we've got some basics down, let's dive into the electrical system in your home. This diagram here shows the supply side of the transformer, also called the secondary coil. You'll see two black wires delivering the two legs of electricity to the home and a white neutral wire. These wires are connected to the electric panel. And in this image, we're focusing on just one circuit. It's connected to the breaker that the arrow is pointing to on the left. So how does electricity flow in this circuit? It travels from the breaker through the wires in the yellow Romex to the electrical outlet and finally to the refrigerator and back. Let's take a closer look at what's inside that yellow Romex that's circled. There's three wires, the black or hot wire, the white neutral wire, and the bare copper wire, which is the ground. What do each of these wires do? Well, the black wire is connected to the smaller slot on the top of the outlet and carries electricity from the power source to the appliance. The white neutral wire connects to the large slot and returns the electricity from the load back to the panel and transformer. And the bare copper wire, the ground wire, is connected to the roundish slot at the bottom of the outlet. The ground wire is critical for safety, as we'll discuss in more detail here in a minute. Now let's look at an exploded view of the wire running from the panel to the refrigerator motor. I've removed the outlet and the refrigerator in this image to simplify things, so we're just focusing on the wires running directly from the panel to the motor. Let's put the electricity in motion. You can see the electricity flowing from the transformer through the breaker, the hot wire to the refrigerator, and then back to the panel through the neutral wire and returning to the transformer. The hot wire supplies electricity to the refrigerator. The neutral's wire job is to give the used voltage a path back to the panel and ultimately to the transformer. So what about the ground wire? Notice there's nothing flowing on that ground wire in this normal operating scenario. Under typical conditions, no electricity flows through the ground wire in your home. In fact, in the entire lifespan of your home, it's possible that no electricity will ever flow on the ground wires. And that's exactly how you want it. The ground wire is there purely as a safety measure. If there's ever an electrical problem with the device, the ground wire provides a low resistance path for electricity to flow back to the panel. And since it's a low resistance path, a very large current will flow, causing the breaker to trip and shutting off power to the device with the problem. Let's break this down with an example. Imagine you've got a refrigerator plugged in. It normally runs on about five amps of current and it's likely protected by a 20 amp breaker. This setup allows the refrigerator to run essentially forever without tripping the breaker, as long as it stays within that five amp range. But now let's say that a hot wire inside the refrigerator comes loose and touches the metal frame. The ground wire from the refrigerator's cord is connected to the metal frame. So as soon as that loose wire makes contact, a large current will flow from the panel through the hot wire to the metal casing and then through the ground wire back to the panel. For example, if the ground wire has a resistance of let's say one ohm, the current flowing uh, through that breaker and back on the ground wire would be 120 amps, 120 volts divided by one ohm. That's easily enough current to trip the breaker immediately. There, did you hear that breaker trip? It tripped to shut off power to that refrigerator and prevent somebody from potentially being electrocuted. Okay, but what if there's no ground wire? In older homes built before about 1970, many circuits didn't have ground wires. So if that same hot wire comes loose and touches the refrigerator frame, there's no ground wire to cause the high current to flow and trip the breaker. As a result, the entire refrigerator becomes energized, and if someone touches it, they could get electrocuted. This is what the ground wire is for, and this is why grounding is so important. Now let's talk briefly about ground faults. We want electricity to stay within the wires and circuits designed to carry it. 
When electricity escapes and takes an unintended path to the ground, this is called a ground fault. The animation I just showed you is an example of a ground fault, and the man who got electrocuted was the path for the ground fault. A ground fault circuit interrupter, or GFCI for short, is a device designed to protect you. If a GFCI detects a ground fault, it shuts off power to the device immediately, protecting people from potential electrocution. And I have a separate video that covers GFCIs in more detail. Now let's go a bit deeper. We've already talked about how your home gets 240 volts, and by using one leg plus a neutral wire, you can power 120 volt appliances. Now let me show you how 240 volt appliances are powered. In this example, we see a transformer supplying 240 volts to the house. One side of the transformer is at negative 120 volts and the other is at positive 120 volts. You can also think of it as one side being at zero volts and the other side being at 240 volts. Remember, voltage is just relative. The current flows from one side of the transformer through the load like a water heater or an air conditioner and back to the transformer. You'll notice that there is no neutral wire in the circuit. These appliances don't need a neutral. And now, here's another 240 volt circuit. This time, it's powering an oven or a clothes dryer. Notice there is a neutral wire here. Why? Some components like lights, buzzers, timers, and displays run on 120 volts. So appliances like ovens and clothes dryers use both 240 volts and 120 volts. And this is why these appliances must have a neutral wire. You'll also see a ground wire connected to each of these appliances. All right, let's take a closer look at the function of the neutral wire on 120 volt circuits. Here's a circuit with three loads running on each leg. The circuit shows 15 amps of current on each leg, but there's nothing on the neutral wire. Why is this? Because current flows from one leg to the other and back. They balance each other out, so nothing flows on the neutral wire. Here's a graph showing the current flowing on leg one and on leg two. And you can see that the two currents match each other exactly in opposite directions. So you don't have anything on that neutral wire. And now let's look at an example of an unbalanced circuit. In this case, you've got 15 amps on one leg and you've got five amps on the other leg. The difference, 10 amps, is running on the neutral wire. The neutral wire always carries the difference in the current between the two legs. And here's a graph that shows what's happening in this unbalanced scenario. You can see 15 amps on one leg and five amps on the other leg. And then the purple line shows the 10 amps that are flowing on the neutral wire. And finally, here's one more example of how current on the neutral wire changes as the current on the two legs fluctuate. So this is electricity in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it, but this covers a lot of the basics and I hope it's been helpful to you. I hope you've learned something. I sure would appreciate a thumbs up and I sure would appreciate it if you would subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate you watching. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.